Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Sponsor Pilani on behalf of the Daily Box. And we usually have our hangouts on Tuesday afternoons, but with the request from the uh, from the Northwest University's um, BC, we are having another hangout today. However, the BC will join us later. And firstly, I'll be speaking to the BC's uh, spokesperson, Professor J.D. Froneman, who will be giving us a background uh, background information on the Northwest University, how it merged, and how this university exists with three different campuses so far apart. Good afternoon, Prof. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for spending some time with us. So, would you? A lot of people don't know how the uh, the Northwest University operates. Would you kindly give us a brief uh, contextual history of how the university operates? Yes, with pleasure. Uh, ten years ago, we were merged. Uh, we had three, uh, basically two universities. That was the uh, University of Northwest, that was in uh, Mafeking, and uh, the Potchefstroom University for Christian Higher Education, with two campuses, the main campus here in, uh, at Potchefstroom, and the uh, the other campus at Funabel Park. So these three campuses, two universities, were merged uh, into the Northwest University. And uh, that's how we have functioned now for about 10 and a half years. Okay. And what is the student uh, demographic? So how many students do, do all the campuses have? And what are the racial demographics, gender-wise? How, how does it look? Well, in total, we have some uh, 63,000 students, 63,000, uh, which is quite large. But I must immediately say that uh, many of those students are off campus. In other words, they're distance learning uh, students. But uh, the uh, main campuses, uh, well, the three campuses then, Potchefstroom, Murphy King, and uh, Vol, each um, has its own uh, rector. Uh, we are quite far from each other. We are a few hundred kilometers from each other, which makes it a very unique sort of situation. You know, we're not like maybe toot with five, four or five or six campuses, but all, you know, within reasonable distance from each other. So we are very far from each other. And we also have a very different uh, historic backgrounds. So uh, getting this together is quite a challenge. Now, our uh, student composition is on the um, Mafeking campus. It's, it's uh, about 95% plus uh, uh, black students. Uh, at the Poch campus, uh, I think we are running about uh, close to 30% black students. Uh, and at the uh, Ball campus, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty balanced. So uh, the three campuses also because of different sort of historic reasons, they, they look different and they have different backgrounds. Okay. And so you say that the historical uh, context of the three universities make it unique. What are these historical uh, differences that make this un uh, this university unique and different from, like you said, Ducks or Vets or even, let's say, University of uh, the Free State? Yes, well, I cannot think of any other university in South Africa which was merged in this particular manner. We had a, 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 a white university, a white Afrikaans university, traditionally, uh, with a history of over 130 years being merged then with a typically historical black university and uh, so uh, you don't have that same sort of situation at any other university in South Africa and then also uh, you have the distance so uh, it was quite a challenge 10 years ago uh, when we uh, were merged to uh, form a, um, a let's say a working model to uh, get this show on the road now my uh, vice chancellor professor Dan Khwadi he has uh, repeatedly said that much good uh, was done in the past 10 years. And he also suggests that the uh, three campus model where you have a rector on each campus uh, was probably the way to go initially because you had these um, universities from totally different uh, backgrounds and so forth to just get this uh, new merged university functioning. It was probably the only way to go is to have sort of separate campuses with very strong uh, campus uh, management. However, uh, the feeling now is, certainly with my vice chancellor, is that it's time to, to move forward and to uh, um, change this 
and therefore we have a, a, a strategy uh, plan and the new structures which are being proposed and so forth to uh, convert this very strong uh, focus on uh, the uh, uh, on the campuses to a more unitary uh, model which will facilitate more inclusion more cohesion and certainly uh, a university which reflects our uh, diversity in a in another way. So we are on the on the brink of very major changes, uh, and this is the way that uh, that my vice chancellor wants us to, wants to take us forward. Okay, you speak about inclusion. In the past week, uh, past three weeks, I've interviewed uh, various uh, students at the uh, Potsdam campus, and who have shown discontent about the level of inclusion at the university they were talking about how in one article i will quote the the lady the student was talking about how the translation devices do not always work and it's not the best way of learning so with these kind of issues with some students feeling more excluded and less included in within the campus what is the university management's way forward to to include students well, um, I would make a few remarks, and then hopefully when my uh, Vice-Chancellor uh, arrives just now, he can take it uh, further. But I think the uh, basic to the our present strategy process, which will result hopefully in, a, in, a, in the acceptance by Council of a new strategy and even new structures. Um, uh, underlying all this is uh, our uh, the vision of Professor Dan Khwadi to have a more inclusive uh, university. So there's no doubt that uh, we don't accept that where we are now is where we should be. We, we accept that uh, inclusion is a, is a, is a, is a problem, uh, a challenge if you like, uh, and that we have to change and to, that we have to be more inclusive and that we, particularly on this campus, uh, where we are, uh, I'm sitting next to this campus, it's, a, it's, it's I'm at the institutional office, and then next door we have the Poch campus, which is technically on its own. Now, um, yeah, there's also, uh, certainly we would like to see more white students on the uh, of again campus. Uh, the, the Vol campus is pretty pretty much in that, that sense, uh, the best balanced of the three uh, campuses. But we fully accept that uh, the the status quo, certainly also on the on our ca uh, campus here in Potchefstroom, is not where we want to be, and therefore we have plans to to move to a more inclusive uni uh, university, certainly a more inclusive um, campus here at Potchefstroom, which will make everyone feel welcome, which will be in terms of language and culture and so forth, will be a place where uh, whether you're black or white. Whether you're Afrikaans or Tswana speaking, or we prefer English, we want this to be a, a campus uh, where everyone will uh, feel safe and welcome and want to come here. That's certainly our vision. And uh, what, what steps is the campus or the university at large taking to, to make a Barchestrom campus more inclusive? Well, that's at the heart of our uh, strategy process because as it is at the moment, the Poch campus is very much an Afrikaans campus. And that is why some of your, uh, uh, what you spoke to some of the students, uh, which find this problematic. Um, uh, historically, it's, it's been an Afrikaans campus now for, well, more than 100 years. Uh, and, uh, and this has been changing to some extent. We have a language policy, which accepts that uh, you can uh, uh, translate um, from Afrikaans to English or English to Afrikaans, you can have different models, and it is actually in practice on this uh, on the Potts campus at this moment. You have some programs which are English only, then you have some programs which uh, uh, which are Afrikaans only. You have parallel medium. You have all different uh, types of language options, which, in terms of our language policy, uh, is um, uh, practiced depending on the specific needs within that specific. Uh, program and uh, but we accept that um, as uh, we draw more and more uh, English speaking I wouldn't like to say black students I'd rather say English speaking students because the color is irrelevant it's a language issue 
uh, if we get more and more students that prefer um, English, for whatever reason, they don't have to explain, it's their choice, then uh, we on the, Poch, on the Poch campus, we must certainly be, uh, be prepared to uh, um, not accommodate in the sense that you say, oh, well, we'll be nice people and we'll accommodate you, but it must simply be structured in such a manner that those people would, would feel as welcome as the Afrikaans students. Now, on the other hand, um, if I may just add this, uh, it should also be a place where Afrikaans students, whether they are black or colored or white, should also still be uh, welcome because they don't have many options in terms of language. And uh, we do feel that presenting the Afrikaans students with an opportunity to study in Afrikaans is also an element maybe of, of social justice. Okay, just, um, you said a mouthful, but I'll start by addressing the issue of language. So I recently, we recently got an, an email from one of the students who says that this call for transformation or for um, more inclusivity is not really about language, but to, uh, quote unquote, it's about getting rid of the culture that exists behind people that speak Afrikaans especially students that speak Afrikaans on the campus. So students at the university are saying that the language is not the problem, but it's the culture that is carried by the language. And in this case, the language is Afrikaans. That makes it very problematic for them and that makes the environment very hostile for them. So what is the what are the steps that the university takes to address um, discrimination and blatant racism that students, black students at the university seem to be facing? Well, um, if I may quote uh, the um, Vice Chancellor, he uh, has specifically spoken out against all racism, whether it's on whatever campus. And uh, now some of your uh, viewers may differ from this, um, but, but racism uh, is something which we find all over the world, certainly all over South Africa. And in that sense, uh, our campus is not, is not different. And we're not denying it, we would not deny it because we are fighting it. So uh, we have to accept it, it's here, it's not good, and certainly we have to take steps. Now, you have to have different steps which you can take. And uh, one of the uh, uh, initiatives which the Vice Chancellor has taken is to start a, um, uh, um, a consultation process between students uh, where we, we, we must get students to speak to each other and to learn to understand each other. That's sort of the basis. And also to hear what, what hurts uh, the other student and, and get to understand each other and move from there. It's, it's, it's a long process. However, students are saying that they don't feel heard. Last week, again, when I was speaking to a student from the campus, she said that I asked about the Human Rights Commission that I found out about that uh, the university has. She said, as somebody who's been on the campus for four years, they didn't know that a human rights commission uh, existed and that there's a platform where she could go as a student to um, address the issues that she was facing, the racism that she feels that she was facing at the university. So what is the management doing to make it clear to students at the university that there's an open door policy with regards to issues of racism or discrimination of any kind? What is, the, uh, is what, are, what kind of campaigns or what kind of what is the kind of tone in which the university speaks about these issues that will make it clear to the students that it is it is okay to talk about these issues and to come to management level with these issues? Well, let's put it this way: uh, it, it hasn't been done good enough. If if there are one student, if there is one student that feels he did not know about this uh, human rights commission and also an ombudsman and so forth and so forth, then, well, then it's not good enough for us. We don't accept that it's good enough. Then we must simply up the ante. We must be stronger in, in communicating this. Now, one of the, 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 the things which, um, ah, here's my vice chancellor now. One of the things which uh, we are uh, dealing with is that if you have a, a single um, a rector, which we don't have at the moment. We have three rectors for each room for each campus. We can, from a central point, in the sense that you have the, the vice chancellor as the, uh, as, the, as the moral authority, stronger push uh, any uh, anti-racism 
uh, projects. And this certainly is what uh, what the Vice Chancellor envisages doing. But I'm happy now to say that he has arrived. <laughs> Welcome, VC. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll greet you and your uh, and your viewers. Thank you for the opportunity to say something, and I uh, hand over now to. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Floriman, for standing in for the vice chancellor as he made his way through. It was a pleasure talking to you. And um, as Professor Floriman has just said, the the VC has arrived, Professor Dan Kwadi, and we'll continue the interview now with the VC, the, the, the man of the moment, so to say, the man that we've been wanting to talk to about these issues of transformation or lack thereof at the Pochisrim campus. Welcome, Professor Kwadi. Oh, welcome, welcome you. And your name again, I know I forgot to put Uh My name is Bonto, Bonto Pilani. Bonzo. Okay, welcome, thank you, Bonzo. Thank you, thank you so much for um, I know you have a very busy schedule. Thank you so much for making time. But uh, without council further, meeting on Friday, so I'm busy right working for that council meeting. <laughs> I can imagine. So without further ado, Professor, I just want to start our conversation by asking you: Do you think the Potsdam campus is transformed? Um, you know, I think I take transformation as a process. Anybody that might want to claim that. Uh, it is done and complete will be not realistic. So I would say it is transforming and we've got even further plans to accelerate the transformation. And this is not just to the Porsche campus, across the university, because uh, we really want to move more away from the campus-based approach, but towards a unitary approach uh, when we deal with uh, university matters. Okay, so let's talk about the language policy, Prof. Uh, you must know, as somebody who is uh, at, in management at university, language policies has been something that's been debated across different campuses and even on a national level in parliament, right? And mm -hmm. so when we look at the Botch campus, it is predominantly um, Afrikaans. And, and the, it seems like even though there's a, there's a partnership with English, but the medium of instruction is predominantly Afrikaans. What are your plans or the university management's plans in terms of Africans remaining the, will Africans remain the medium of instructions or are they plans to move away from that and include other languages as well? Okay. Yes, I think you, you're right. We seem to be reliving the 1976 uh, with regard to language and Africans particularly. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, coming direct to your question, what we want to caution everyone on is to depoliticize the language issue because Africans must not really be a political argument. Why I'm saying it should not be a political argument, uh, it should not be seen as, uh, you know, Africans is a language for Africaners because the majority speakers are actually not Africaners. You know, our colored students and the non-African speaking community is in percentage is much more than the Africana. But what we okay. are emphasizing on is we should not have a language that is operational in any of our campuses in an exclusive way. In an exclusive way, in a manner that it should not uh, limit access of non speakers of the language. But Professor, let's, uh, uh, can we really separate the politics of the language that is Afrikaans from, can we really separate the language itself and the politics? And also just to add on to that, when we look at uh, the students, the Afrikaans speaking students on the campus that are in question right now, are they not predominantly white? Are they really mostly colored or are they white? Because I really think that it would be very hard to separate the politics from the actual language given our history. That's exactly, I think you're right. What, what we are always cautioning against is to say, if we use Africans and we use the language as a proxy for race, then that is the unfortunate turn of, of the argument. But in its purest form, it must not be a race issue. But it is unfortunate, as you have picked it up, because of the majority of the students on a campus, then it becomes some kind of a proxy for race. And in our policy, we do not want to 
have a policy implemented in a manner that then the language is a proxy for race. The practicality is also a bit of a challenge, as you say, because of the numbers, because of the population, uh, the, the students being mostly white Africana students. So many a times, then when we spoke, when we speak of Africans and the Africana, the thin, there is a very thin line, and therefore it racializes the argument. But like I was saying right now um, to Professor Froneman before he left, uh, in this, I've spoken to about um, more than, I've interviewed more than 10 students at the Pachi mm -hmm. campus, the majority of them being black students, mm -hmm. and they have been talking about the experiences that they face at the university that they say and that they feel that they wouldn't experience that if they were not black. So because of that race, certain things are happening. And it's not just from unmanaging, uh, uh, the university management level, but from fellow students. So what, what, what are your thoughts around the, the fact that the language is very, very attached to race and it's being used not by the management, but by students as well, as a tool to exclude and discriminate against others? Yes. That, that's exactly what I said in the beginning, that that's the unfortunate part, if a language is used in an exclusive manner. The language policy seeks to embrace all languages, but at a practical level, well, it's like perhaps if you can ask me that, is there really no discrimination? Is, is there no such? I will tell you, we will be very unrealistic to expect that with the history and the country that we are in, such will not exist. But it is not, and it shouldn't be a, uh, a, a position of the university. Individuals are individuals. I always say the university is a microcosm of the society. As long as we still have these discriminatory ten tendencies and perhaps even some stereotypes that are still out there in the communities, we will always have those filtering through into the universities. The heartbeat of the community out there, the pulse thereof, we will always pick it at the university. But what we need to do, and which is what we are doing, is now together with the university community, all the concerns groups and students, the student leadership and the management, together with council as well, are working together to ensure that then the university addresses all these ills that come through the societies that we are part of. How will the uni how will the university respond to these issues? I I hear that you and probably the the man the management at large is aware of these issues. But how are you responding to these issues? For example, you know, currently there is a movement that is being formed where students feel like they have like for, uh, I've interviewed stu a lot of students, a lot of them that have chosen to remain anonymous because they feel like they will be victimized by the university if they were to reveal their identity when talking about the kind of discrimination they face at, at the campus. So what is, how are you going to address these issues as the management of the university? Yeah. Firstly, we encourage robust engagement. And I've said that to the students and perhaps because now there's a bit of more freedom and people are aware that we are encouraging engagement. That's why you see the uh, uh, some organizations coming into place, some organizations being formed so that the voice that has not been heard or that was fearful in the past can now express itself. But obviously there will always be concerns in terms of, uh, if you say, victimization or whatever, there will always be those concerns to say, hey, what will happen to me if I express? But we have called and uh, uh, allowed students, and not only students, you see even members of the community, all stakeholders are expressing themselves robustly in, in this debate. For us, it is important to hear all these voices because we take those concerns and integrate them in our current strategy formulation so that we can address all the issues. Okay, so Prof, do you feel that um, that you are being pressured to transform at a slower pace than you would like because of, we, we have to be honest about the threat that transformation poses on the Africa, uh, people of Africans speaking 
um, backgrounds, right? We can, that, that is one thing that I think we can both be honest about. And do you think that they, do you think that you're being pressurized to now transform slowly, so to say, in order to preserve Africans as the medium of instruction and also to preserve the culture that Africans has freely bred at the Pottersfield campus? Okay, good. Yes, I, I, I must say, when it comes to the pace of transformation, it depends on which side you sit in. There are concerns and uh, people that are worried about it being a revolutionary process. And then there are those that are also concerned that it is more evolutionary. So it's slow and others are saying it's fast. And I guess perhaps the answer is somewhere in between. But I can always say, as far as uh, transformation is concerned, yes, uh, I always say it's like planting a tree. The best time is always in the past. So whenever we started, it was already late at that time. And it's not that we haven't started. We started in the past, but it was already late. We should have done that even much earlier. So therefore, as a result, there will always be these concerns. Uh, as far as, you know, Africans and its threat to transformation, I do not... No. Transformation yeah. and its threat to Africans. Oh, transformation being a threat to Africans. Yes. Yeah, I think that I have, I've, I've expressed myself and uh, in terms of the university policy so far, that uh, those threats, you know, it's like I've said, it's, it's more like crying at a wrong funeral because transformation is not at all aiming at killing Africans. So <laughs> that's, that's not it. That's not it at all. <laughs> but we must always take into account that as, as a responsible country, and I'm, and I'm sharing this view that, because the minister also shares the same view, that, hey, what if, if we have schools that are Africans only schools, where will those kids go if we do not cater for them at higher education? And in so doing, let us not do it excluding those that cannot speak Africans. So a balance must be somewhere in between. And as a university, we really have to find a solution to this. Yeah, I always say universities are meant to come up with solutions. And we have to bring up, come up with a prototype that will address the complexity of the environment that we operate in because of we are not a simple country. We are also a complex in a society. It's a very complex society we're dealing with. So it therefore takes special leadership from both at a governance level, at management level, and student leadership level to navigate this complexity. So Prof, what do you think is, uh, what is the responsibility of African speaking students, management, lecturers, and everyone who is involved in the Project Stream campus? What do you think is their responsibility in this process of transformation? What do they, what do they have to compromise in order to make this transformation process for their campus easy? I want to say, it, you know, it's like a, when a child has got a toy that he treasures so much, when others come into his company, the worst thing that that child would do is to take it and, uh, and start crying in, antici in anticipation that they are going to steal his toy or they are going to destroy it. What the child does is to take the toy and share it with all of them. So it is not in an exclusive, but it is in an inclusive way. And when that happens, you can be guaranteed that everybody will appreciate the toy and after using it, they will also leave it into his safe hands for use in the future. I therefore say the African speaking community must also be aware of their approach. The worst thing will be to try and use Africans in an exclusive way, because then in that case, there will be all sorts of attitudes that will develop and it, it makes the problem much more complex. So the solution lies in being inclusive and in appreciating the differences that we have. Okay, Prof, what, are, what is the first thing on your list when it comes to actually transforming the campus? What is the first thing that you want to, to do in the next, uh, let's say, yeah? Yes, we have said really what we look, given the three different campuses that we have and with all the differences in terms of quality, in terms of resources, 
The first thing is to ensure that we make Northwest University a more unitary institution. And of course, in terms of the core business, then the best thing will be to ensure that we become superior excellence, an, excell an, an institution of superior academic excellence. And mm -hmm. social integration is important. And if we are to talk about social justice, we are then have to we then have to look at issues relating to resources, equity of resources across all our campuses, equity of student experience across our campuses, and also to ensure that we develop a new institutional culture that will then be embraced by all of us. And what what kind of institutional culture is this that you want the, the new institutional culture that you would like uh, the university to have? Exactly. A culture is something that evolves from the current situation. It's not something that you come and dictate and by definition, this is what we should do and where we go, where we need to go. But firstly, I want a culture that is based as far as the core business is concerned, a culture that embraces the Northwest University, which is committed to social justice and the Northwest University that is of superior academic excellence. All other issues that perhaps are part of our traditions and history and all that will definitely be influenced and will have to take a new direction on the basis of the, the new institution. And that is not something that you can define because it has to evolve by students as they embrace new practices as they perhaps keep some good practices in the past and do away with other practices. And that will therefore determine the new culture of the university. Lastly, Professor, I just want to ask you, what, I, what is your message to the black students that are having bad experiences on the campus, that are experiencing racism and discrimination and feeling excluded? What are you as the vice chancellor saying to them about, about the environment in which they're living in that is very violent to their very nature? Yes, what, what I'll say is this, that uh, as we, we encourage engagement, I want them to express themselves without fear for victimization. And uh, the worst thing, of course, I will do is to deny that the research. If somebody experiences something, that experience has to teach us something. And we want to hear from them so that we can be as objective as possible to deal with the issues in creating an environment that will be conducive to all our students. And I, if I'm perhaps to come to your initial question about what culture as well are we looking at, it will also be very important for everyone to feel safe in this environment. An environment that is safe for all our students in all our campuses. And how will you make the, the how will you make the discussion or the platform to discuss these issues opening to all parties concerned going forward from now on? How, if students have these issues, how is the university going to make it okay or safe, a safe environment for students to be able to, to show these issues and yes. talk about Firstly, them? If anyone starts to feel that he is or she is being victimized, I would call on them to contact me directly and immediately so that we cannot, we must do away with that feeling or that environment if it exists. But then the next thing is we're going to engage with students and the university community in different fora. There's going to be a series of, you know, our Northwest University roundtable discussions. We want to encourage a university that goes as far as debates are concerned, formalized and arranged debates where we can go and talk and express ourselves freely and, and also, of course, not just talk for talk's sake, but to ensure that management gets informed about the environment on the ground that we need to consider in our strategic uh, planning as well. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Professor Dan Khwadi has spent a few minutes with us talking about his plan and the university uh, plan on transforming the Pochestrum campus. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Please catch us next week, Tuesday, again, while we talk about the different burning issues when it comes to student governance and movement. Have a good day.